In this video, we'll examine how Hitchcock's encounter with the cinema of Jean Cocteau helped to shape his film Psycho. And we'll pay particular attention to the influence of two films, Beauty and the Beast and Orpheus. In thinking about Cocteau's films and their relation to Psycho, I believe it's possible for us to catch a glimpse into how Hitchcock appropriates another master's work into his own in order to flesh out his own personal relationship with the cinema. Cocteau's Orphée is set in 1950s Paris, and it's a variation of the classic Greek myth of Orpheus. The film depicts a famous poet, Orpheus, and his love for both his wife, Eurydice, and a mysterious princess, who we'll name Princess Death. Orphée begins with Orpheus visiting a cafe when a brawl breaks out. When the police arrive and attempt to take another poet, suggest into custody, Suggest breaks free and flees, only to be run down by two motorcycle riders. Princess Death has her police henchman place Suggest into her car in order to transport him to the hospital. She also orders Orpheus into the car in order to act as a witness. Once in the car, Orpheus discovers Suggest is dead and that Princess Death is not, in fact, going to the hospital. Instead, they drive to an isolated chateau, accompanied by the motorcycle-riding henchmen police officers. At the ruined chateau, Princess Death reanimates Jest into a zombie-like state, and she and her henchmen disappear into a mirror. It's clear that Orpheus has found an entrance to an underworld. For our purposes of finding Hitchcock's references to Cocteau's work in Psycho, let's keep in mind Princess Death's police henchmen that guard her and patrol the streets leading to the underworld. In Psycho, after stealing $40,000, Marion Crane leaves Phoenix to travel to her boyfriend's house in California. But before she can arrive, she stops and sleeps on the side of a highway in the middle of a desert. Here we find Hitchcock's first explicit reference to Cocteau's work. Marion, asleep in the desert, is questioned by none other than a police officer. If we take a step back to consider the themes in Orphe and Psycho, this connection becomes rather clear. Where does Marion Crane's journey lead her? Marion never arrives at her boyfriend's in California. Instead, she finds herself, eventually, at the Bates Motel. The Bates Motel, I argue, is Hitchcock's appropriation of Cocteau's underworld. Let's consider it. The Bates Motel is a place where death exudes from everywhere. The surrounding swamp that consumes all. The taxidermied birds. The implications of necrophilia. And, of course, mother sitting in the window of the old house. It's altogether a place seemingly lost to time. The Bates Motel seems to be a world fully existing within its own parameters, mirroring and yet upsetting what's outside of it. So, isn't it an underworld? In addition, when considering the reference to Cocteau, let's consider that in Orphe, after Orpheus attempts to go through the mirror into the underworld for the first time, he fails, and he finds himself lost in the desert. The desert, a place devoid of all life, where Orpheus must then find his way back home. I believe it's no coincidence that Hitchcock places Marion in a desert, where she encounters the policeman, one of Princess Death's henchmen, who guards the road to Hitchcock's underworld, i.e. the Bates Motel. Let's now look at how Hitchcock builds and expands upon these themes with his relationship to the film La Belle et la Bête, or Beauty and the Beast. In an eerily similar fashion to Psycho, Beauty and the Beast involves a blonde female protagonist leaving her home and entering into an underworld. In Beauty and the Beast, that underworld is the Beast's castle, 
And just like the Bates Motel, the Beast's Castle is a place where death reigns supreme. Let's follow Marion's journey to the Bates Motel and Beauty's journey to the Beast's Castle and pay close attention to how Hitchcock and Cocteau go into great detail in order to make us feel like Marion and Beauty's journeys are, truly, a descent into an underworld. The girl works for you for ten years, you trust her. All right, yes, you better come over. Well, I ain't about to kiss off $40,000. I'll get it back, and if any of it's missing, I'll replace it with her fine, soft flesh. I'll track her, never you doubt it. Oh, hold on, Cass. I still can't believe it. It must be some kind of a mystery. I, I can't. You check with the bank, no? They never laid eyes on her, no? You still trust him? Hot creeper, she sat there while I dumped it out. Hardly even looked at it. Planning and, and even flirting with me. The similarities between the characters of Beast in Beauty and the Beast and Norman Bates in Psycho are striking. Let's consider them. Both are young men that live alone in a big, dilapidated house or castle surrounded by death. In Norman's case, death can be found in the stuffed birds on the walls and mother's carefully preserved body, the swamp where all things go to die. In Beast's case, death can be found in the surrounding old woods, the statues that mark the landscape, the candlesticks, and plastered sculptures that line the castle walls. But there are even more similarities between Norman and Beast. Both seem to have reluctantly accepted their lonesome fate. Well, how are you supposed to pass the time, not fill it? Is your time so empty? Both want a human connection, and perhaps most importantly, both find themselves attracted to the blonde woman that has unfortunately found her way into their Beast and Norman's underworld. Belle, voulez-vous être ma femme? In addition, Hitchcock in Psycho reimagines the first encounter that Beast and Beauty have where Beast asks Beauty on her first day in the castle if she'll have dinner with him. Ne craignez rien, vous ne me verrez jamais, sauf chaque soir à sept heures où vous dînerez. In Hitchcock's film, Norman asks Marion the same exact thing. You're not really going to go out again and drive up to the diner, are you? No. Well, then would you do me a favor? Would you have dinner with me? I was just about to myself. You know, nothing special, just sandwiches and milk, but I'd like it very much if you'd come up to the house. I, I don't set a fancy table, but the kitchen's awful homey. I'd like to. Now let's take a look at what I will refer to as the dinner scenes that both films have. Both dinner scenes open in the same way. In Beauty and the Beast, Beauty is sitting at the table as the inanimate objects stare down from the walls at her. In Psycho, Marion watches, nervous, as Norman's stuffed birds of prey seemingly stare down at her from the walls. Both women are shown as vulnerable in these scenes and open to attack from not only the men that they are with, but from all sides. 
both Beast and Norman do something quite interesting. After asking Belle and Marion to dine with them, they themselves do not eat. You're very kind. It's all for you. I'm not hungry, go ahead. Norman and Beast insist on watching Marion and Beauty eat. It's an interesting decision and one that can be examined through what these characters, Norman and Beast, actually desire. Both Norman and Beast have an object of desire, and it's not food that will quench their hunger, but rather the possession of Marion and Beauty themselves. Both Norman and Beast are attracted to Marion and Beauty. Food does these men no good in quenching their hunger. Instead, for them, the only consumption that can fulfill their desire is the woman herself. It's a lust that is altogether possessive. Hitchcock continues to reference Cocteau throughout the sequence. After the dinner scenes end, both Beast and Norman, still hungry for they haven't quenched their desire to possess Marion and Beauty, are, one could argue, in fact, after their conversations at dinner, even more hungry, famished. Cocteau relates Beast's inability to repress his desire to possess Beauty with violence. For Cocteau, desire and violence are interrelated. One leads to the other. Cocteau shows Beast walking through the halls of the castle in agony, his hands ablaze with smoke. The conflation of desire and violence, unmistakable. Unable to control himself, Beast enters Beauty's bedroom without her permission. When he does not find her there, he spies on her through a magic mirror that allows him to spot Beauty in the hallway outside. The scene is altogether voyeuristic, and the undertones of sexuality and violence can't be ignored. These themes of violence, sexuality, and voyeurism in Cocteau's work are not lost on Hitchcock. In Psycho, after the dinner scene with Marion, Norman too is filled with a strong desire to possess Marion. When Marion retreats to her hotel room, eerie music swells and the parlor room throws dark, slanted shadows across Norman's face. Norman, like Beast, goes in search of Marion, and just like Beast, he spies, voyeuristically, on her. At this point, it should be clear that Hitchcock is not shy in his appropriation of Cocteau's work. But Hitchcock is able to transform his admiration for Cocteau's work from mere appropriation and uses Cocteau's themes to then form his own thematic statement. Hitchcock, now, at this point in the story, sways from Cocteau in one very significant way. Where Cocteau has his character, Beast, control his urges and suppress his violent delights, Hitchcock takes a different route. Norman, still charged with the longing to possess Marion, retreats to the old house. Here, Norman transforms into mother and returns to Marion's motel room where, in a fit of violent, sexual, and jealous rage, he murders Marion. The plot of Psycho, from here on out, loses references to Cocteau and for the most part becomes a standard whodunit film. The majority of the philosophical ideas expressed by Hitchcock can be found in the first 45 minutes of the film. But there is one other scene that is of the utmost importance for us if we wish to fully understand Hitchcock's personal, and I do mean personal, relationship to the cinema as a whole, and the role that he, the director, has in his own films. These relationships can be best understood by examining the scene where the psychologist explains how Norman Bates, at the end of the film, is mother. I got the whole story, but not from Norman. I got it from his mother. Norman Bates no longer exists. He only half existed to begin with. My belief is that Alfred Hitchcock, the director, 
inserts himself into Psycho as the character of Mother. Through the character of Mother, Hitchcock is then able to raise philosophical questions about his own relationship with his art. But for the sake of time, this video will end here. In the next video, we'll dive into this idea more deeply, but for now I'll leave you with this, and perhaps you can mull it over and think about it in the meantime. Mrs. Bates and Alfred Hitchcock, are they one and the same? Mrs. Bates? If you like this video, hit the like button and subscribe. I'll try to keep the videos as coming as fast as possible. Thanks.